Good afternoon, all. Welcome. This is the FMA discussion. This is episode 167 already. Um, coming on the 200 mark, believe it or not. Sooner than uh, sooner I like to. <laughs> but at any rate, today we have the uh, fortunate, um, I'm most fortunate to have these guys on. Um, this is, I, went, I, I wouldn't say so much looking outside the lens of FMA because FMA is definitely going to be included in this conversation, discussion. But really, we're looking at uh, kind of HEMA and what these gentlemen are doing. I think it's pretty exciting. I think your folks are going to find the same. So welcome our guests here. We have Morgan Garrett and Lee Smith. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dean. Hey, thanks, Dean. And funny enough, it's actually Lee Smith. It's actually under my Facebook name is Lee Smith. And that only came because I was uh, partying one night when I made my Facebook account. And I misspelled my own name because I didn't even know I made a Facebook account. That tells you so how I'm many drinks we might have had Germany. sending my friend back to Germany. Okay. We went. We, good, I was, I was gonna say we, we we went a little Canadian. <laughs> hey, uh, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna make it work. So uh, you know, so this is your first time, guys, coming on. So what I always like to do for the community watching is just kind of get where uh, folks can hear about your background and all that. So um, we're gonna cover both. So uh, so let's start with uh, Morgan. So why don't you tell us about your uh, your background, FMA, and all that good stuff? Thanks, Drew. So like most people, I started my early childhood doing karate or some basic form of martial art. I had a single mother and, uh, you know, so she was looking for something to help her discipline and structure her child. And martial arts was one of the things that she chose for me. So I started martial arts early. Um, didn't start getting into uh, bladed martial arts until I would say about the mid nineties, I was exposed to Japanese martial arts and, uh, it would be like kenjutsu and kendo, stuff like that. Uh, so that was a lot of my early bladed martial career would be its foundation in Japanese martial arts. And uh, from there, I moved to the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> Before I had moved in the mid 90s, about 93, I went to a martial arts expo in Pasadena, California. And it was kind of one of those typical martial arts expos that you see where there's a lot of extreme martial arts with the weapons, uh, a lot of screaming and sparkly stabs or comma, different kinds of weapons. And the kids are going through their forms and yelling and ki and a lot of this kind of stuff. And in the back of the room, there was a gentleman doing a demonstration on Filipino martial arts. And it happened to be Dan and Asanto. So that was kind of my first exposure to Filipino martial arts was just kind of watching this guy at a, at a, at a martial arts expo describe his cultural art. And I didn't really think much of it at the time. I was about 23 and I was doing sushi and kendo and all this other stuff. So I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Not realizing the underlying contention between Japanese martial arts and Filipino martial arts and the occupations and all this nonsense, mm. right? So as I moved on through life, I moved to the Pacific Northwest, continued uh, my martial career, but it was mostly a lot of self-practice and self-study because in the area I was living, I wasn't finding a lot of practitioners that were willing to cross train or practice what I was doing. So it was a lot of self-study and, uh, things on YouTube. And then I began to watch a lot of videos that were centered around Bikiti Tircia. Um, a lot of Tim Wade's videos at the time were being put mm -hmm. out in, you know, 2010, 2012, 2013, these kind of videos started coming out and I started watching a lot of it. And uh, he was a, definitely a foundation in my movement the way that I wanted to move, I, I really liked Tim's footwork a lot. Um, and then I saw the Dog Brothers National Geographic oh, yeah. <laughs> or documentary series. And I was really intrigued with that. Of course, I had already left the state and I was, you know, doing other things that I had never gotten exposure to it. But 
I think there's a point in the video where they say, you know, there's two reactions to the Dog Brothers community. There's either the reaction of like, oh, these guys are crazy, or wow, what the heck is this, right? Yeah, so yeah. I was one of the wow guys, right? And I was really interested in what they were doing. And I realized that uh, they were testing themselves on a different level, that one of Mark Denny, Guru Denny's uh, sayings is higher consciousness through harder yeah, contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that requires you to not um, depend upon the safety of your gear, like a pro gauntlet or a fencing mask. In mm. fact, many of these gentlemen that were the early dog brothers were fighting in gen one fencing masks like gym masks it's true that i, I mean these arms. masks yeah. have taken such a beating that they're basically a beanie right at this point they're not even a, a protective mask <laughs> nick papadakis is famous for having a gen one mask with no bib on it that he fights with mm -hmm. consistently so their theory was you know uh minimal gear and of course, me being a sushi chef and a musician and a lot of different areas where my hands were important, I you know wanted to be an ass kicker, but I didn't want to get my ass kicked, if that <laughs> makes sense, right? So I started participating in HEMA up here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's a local group here uh, owned by a friend of mine named Jason Brown called the uh, Sword Guild, and uh, I started to spar with uh, the gear that HEMA was developing. And I found it appealing. It was protective enough that uh, you know, were damaging your body. And mm -hmm. I was seeing that these guys were fighting with, you know, steel fetters and different weapons other than rattan, and they were fighting safely. So I was like, you know, it was an interesting fighting community. Um, and the idea about, oh, well, that's just kind of basically where I come from. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Career, just as a start, if you want to give Lee a shot. Yeah, yeah. And folks, it. if you're watching, uh, please tell us where you're watching from. We got Amanda. Ah, Trisha from Vancouver, another BC here. Awesome. Nice to see you. Hello yeah. hello to a new friend from France. Yeah, Trisha's awesome. And uh, yeah, smash that like button. Uh, all right, let's get into. Uh, so uh, uh, let's hear it, Lee. So, uh... All right. So I'm the founding instructor of, of Blood and Iron Martial Arts. Um, in HEMA, there are no lineages. And this is going to be kind of weird for a lot of people who do FMA. So it's like zero yeah, lineages. Yeah. I would actually argue now that you're seeing lineages develop. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting to see that. Like my background, I grew up, I grew up fighting. I grew up in a rough area. I mean, <laughs> I come from a family where we have these big, huge prairie prairie people family reunions, and I mean, at least there's at least there's at least four or five fights that break out. And I mean, this is just the family I grew up in. So, bully at school, grandma's grandma's looking after me. She's like, knock him out. So that's basically what I did. <laughs> Learned that the hard way. Grew up grew up that way. She's like, a man has to, like I, she was really instrumental in my life. My grandmother, my mother especially. And they're like, if you're if you're gonna deal with people in life, a man has to be able to speak, he has to be able to think, and he has to be able to fight. And if he can't do any of the three, he's not a man. So this is what I grew up around, and I was like maybe like Nehi at that time. So I learned that that lesson early, and I was there was really no real like in, in our area. There's like karate and stuff, and I didn't really do any of that. I wasn't really interested in it. Um, I did a lot of athletics growing up, soccer, that kind of stuff. Um, but none of it was really high level. It just wasn't the area we're in. It's not exactly the best area. Um, then when we moved out, I uh, got to. I had the opportunity. To, uh, my friends would introduce me to Bill Wolf. He were training with, and I. And back when it was Hapkido before it hit Modern Defendo. But realistically, nothing changed in the curriculum. It was always Modern Defendo, to be honest with you. Um, so I trained with him for for a few years when I was younger. Then I went off to college. Basically, got two diplomas in journalism. Um, came back. Just nothing in the field. Worked, worked a few years, mostly did that time at gun work and knife work, trained a lot of defensive pistol. At one point I was shooting 600 rounds a week, no joke. Oh, wow. So I bounced around from that. And then one day I seen some guys fighting with swords in a park, picked it up. I always liked swords. There's just like really few opportunities. And I was like, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Three weeks later, play second in my first tournament. And then after that, it was just like, read manuscript, study biomechanics, 
look at different martial arts, look what they're doing, mm -hmm. analyze, interpret, and then just continue to refine process. So for me, it was I, basically the sign, I use the scientific method to my advantage. Just took it into took my education and I made it work. I did tons of research. This is what you do in four years of journalism. That's all you do is research. So, mm. and then on top of that, I had all the basics and the um, and the fundamentals I learned from Bill. So, knife being my pro my first weapon, when I transitioned to rapier, it became a very natural transition, very easy transition from modern combatives. I mean, the li I could I could probably draw in a different episode. I could probably draw you a line showing you different techniques and how they actually work from rapier to modern knife combatives. Oh, wow. okay. okay. A direct line. It, it, it's really translatable. Usually I treat you to teach the two in tandem to some of my, to my more advanced students. So um, 15 years later from starting Blood and Iron, um, here we are. I have had up to four locations. Um, we have one in New Mexico as a small study group. Both of our main locations are downgraded to a study group, and then this one up here in Mid Island will now be another um, another full location. But it's kind of a different focus. It'll be a little more, a little more like a harder push. I'm going to accept 20 students and call it a day. Mm. But I've traveled all over the world. I've taught in different countries. I've taught in Shanghai. I taught in Shanghai in 2019. Um, I teach in Mexico regularly. We have a successful online program. So even with COVID. We're um, even with COVID, we're doing well. Like I mean, oh, good, good, shockingly good. well. The oh, first good, time I good. saw Lee, he was uh, on ESPN three, I believe, fighting Jake Norwood. Yeah, I was on ESPN three. Yeah, I lost oh, that I match. It had broke my wrist, and I had, and I had uh, dislocated my collarbone prior to finals. I shouldn't have been fighting, oh, but my I told my coach and my corner coach, I'm like, yeah, I'm fighting anyway. I couldn't. I it was so bad, I couldn't grip my sword to cut. Belton. Hey, Belton. Right. So I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting day, I'll tell you that. Still came close, only lost by a point, so it wasn't wasn't too bad. So, um, so based on your you know your description there, mostly definitely from the HEMA aspect and all that, and not that this is important, it's just more that curiosity for the folks that are watching. The, um, prior to obviously meeting you know Morgan and, and Belton, any FMA like crossover or training or. I fenced a few guys who did some FMA. That's okay. really okay. Yeah. about about it. Yeah, absolutely. Me again. personally, I like I said, I, I saw Dan and Asanto back in the early '90s at a seminar, and then as I moved into the Pacific Northwest, it was a lot of self study. Um, when I started to conceptualize the idea for my event, I approached. I literally just cold called to Han Nick Papadakis because he was hosting a stick and knife event in the Valley, in the San Fernando Valley um, at Valley Martial Arts called Stick and Knife. And it was very different from what they were doing in the Dog Brothers. So I decided to call Nick and just ask him flat out, you know, how he was running his tournaments, you know, what, what he was doing because obviously they were a huge influence on me and, and what I and what we do. So as I approached him, he said, you know, the person that's local in your area that you should be talking to is Robert Koenig. And Robert Koenig is a NSI practitioner who's very close with Dr. Kelly Warden and Guru Tuhan, superhuman Belton here. So um my introduction to FMA in the Pacific Northwest starts with Nick Papadakis and moves through Robert Koenig into Belton Lewis. Okay. So that's kind of how I got into Pekiti Tiersis so deeply because a lot of my self-study was involved around the influential videos that I was finding on YouTube. Once I found out that Belton was very closely connected with Grand Tuhan, and that one of the focuses of his school was Pekiti Tiersia, I attached myself to him and became his student. Okay, no, all right, all right. So, um, so for me, before we get into me and Mateo, so to speak, how did you guys, I guess the three of you, I don't, I don't know the exact order, obviously, who met who first or what, how the coalition started, but uh, what, um, how did, come about how did it come about were you guys uh, kind of working together and what today what we have as far as your guys creation 
Um, so that would start with me and starting that chain through Nick Papadakis, Robert Koenig, and Belton. This was the FMA component of the Short Blade Symposium. As I wanted to incorporate other fighting communities because I envisioned this event as a multicultural event, I had realized that I couldn't just go to the HEMA community and cold call them and say, hey, I've got this great event and you need to do it. Because they were already established as a fighting community. They already had their tournament circuit from different regions. And really, I'm a small potatoes, no-name guy. So for me to come to their community and tell them, hey, I've got something that you should pay attention to would be quite ridiculous. So I started to incorporate myself in the HEMA community here in Portland, Oregon. And through my association with Jason Romdell Brown and the Sword Guild Portland is how I met Lee Smith. Okay. Okay. And then that's kind of sounds like that's what you guys obviously uh, had a conversation and kind of one, one thing led to another. Yeah. I just liked the idea. I was like, this is great. Yeah. But I got to make this awesome guy Belton here who I don't get to see due to COVID. <laughs> <laughs> No, COVID, COVID, COVID. Yeah. Hopefully that'll be a name that we'll never hear again, huh? Right. Uh, yeah. well, uh, <laughs> so when you guys um when you guys kind of all talk, I mean like uh I mean obviously just took some plan coordination. Uh, how did you guys uh you know, did the three of you guys kinda of get together, meet, or was there what how'd you guys go about it as far as kind of laying down the groundwork? Oh really Morgan just set the event up told Belt and I to show up, we did, and then we made it work. <laughs> really, is that a what lot of, about right, Belton? Yeah, a lot of this went on through social media and uh -huh. uh, conversations between Belton and Lee and I setting up the event. Um, I wanted Belton originally because I didn't want the environment realizing that in a competitive environment the fighter is not only fighting his opponent but sometimes he might find himself fighting the judges right and i didn't want that stress on the fighters i wanted them free to feel like they were uh just concentrating on the fight and their opponent and not having to worry about bad calls or being judged unfairly and in order to do that in an environment where we have multiple cultures coming in, you have to have equal representation. And in the year one of the Short Blade Symposium, it was really just FMA and HEMA. So I had to have three judges from FMA and three judges from HEMA that would be willing to participate in, in the uh, event. And part of the judges criteria was one, you had to own your own school, which both of these gentlemen do. Mm -hmm. Two, you had to be a well-respected member of your communities, which both of these gentlemen are. Three, you have to host your own tournament, which Lee hosts his own tournaments. Belton hosts the Warrior Strength Tip-On, Tip-On. So they're familiar with tournament structure. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was my basic requirements for what you needed to be to be a judge. And as long as I held equal representation, nobody from FMA would go, I was judged by HEMA guys and I was judged unfairly. Uh, yeah. And likewise from the HEMA guys. Yeah. Where, where did six come about? Was that, is, is that, did you just choose six judges or is that a common practice to have six judges? That comes from HEMA and uh, I think that Lee would probably be best to address that. Okay, so that, so it's, it's in, okay, so it'll be all, make it brief. Basically, if you have three judges, you have three judges on either side creating kind of like triangles. You're looking oh. for calls for concise calls from two judges. Um, we did it this way because honestly, staffing is always an issue at any tournament. Everyone wants to play, nobody wants to work. So mm. the three of us tend to do most of the work with a few other of our friends as well out there. So we got about six people who like who we can rely upon and give us periodic breaks, we'll say. Is that about right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Belt, last time I think the last tournament we were in it was like just it was like eight hours straight. But just to give you an example, tough. Yeah. so you have these basically these triangles that are formed, 
And that way judges can see fairly accurately. They're expected to move around the circle to try to keep the best ang angle on the fighter they can. This way the judge accuracy goes up. If I'm holding a HEMA tournament, the difference would be that I would have judges from different tournaments essentially judging as well. If I'm looking at a full complement of judges in a HEMA tournament that I've trained myself, last time I went to Las Vegas, I brought 25 students, all of them had to work, and they and we had friends bolster us. So co full complement of 30, 40 judges plus directors. So normally the rule set I would have would be one director in center who can override everything, three three judges, one on, creating that triangle formation, coming in like pie, like basically pies, and then the judge, then the director having the ability to overrule. Okay. Now, just the Shortblade Symposium, our FMA. What, what, Dean, what'd you say? One second, Morgan. No, I'm just oh, curious. Sorry. I didn't know if that was a standard as far as the six judges. So it, it was interesting. Uh, there's no, there's no standards in HEMA, my friend. Okay. We're, there were like different people are going to do it different ways. That's just the you. standard oh, okay. I use. You guys just chose to have six. Okay. 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 So at the the first Shortblade Symposium for FMA, the Guest judges were two Han Philip Galinas and Belton, and one of Belton's students, um, I believe it was Josh Rogers. So I think that uh, two two on Belton here can give a good experience what he thought about the the judging and um, judging situation. All right, let's hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the first time we had it, that's when I met Lee. Um, you know, it, it, I heard I heard the rule sets, the scoring system, um, and you know they even had a cutting demonstration to kind of go, hey, let's be realistic here. If mm -hmm. you know we, we we came at it at this this hard of an angle, no one's going to go come in and just like these weak half. And you know, I'm not trying to knock down weak half, but you know, 25 single tap 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 to the head, and where nobody's clicking away like that. Um, so the three judges, what I liked was that the significant hits were really, um, what's the word, um, uh, uh, noted for, you know, they, they were accounted for. And so, you know, we, we all recognize that, we respected that. Yes, was there stop and go, racked up the points, but we, we, we scored it according to where some of the most damage, if this was truly a situation, and that was a machete, a, a, a blade, oh, yeah. you know, what, what are the, what are, what's gonna like end that fight? What's realistic and where do we award the most points? So judging wise, you know, you know, I've been in stick fights and we just go. I mean, just go separate them a little bit, go again. And yeah. I mean, I, I you can watch some of my fights. I mean, I'll pound a guy with three to five hits and maybe one one of those three or five is like, dude, you're you're kind of done, man. I mean, I hit you no, in the head pretty hard with a yeah. freaking. So it was nice to see that. Um, you know, what, what, what I noticed that first tournament um, was um, – the the interaction between HEMA and FMA. So, in my opinion, what I saw was, you know, we brought our FMA guys down, uh, Guru Sean, Guru Josh. They're both uh, gurus under me and Warrior Strength FMA. Um, and just them, the the knife guys, when it came to knife, uh, the top three were all FM, FMA guys. You know, Lamont, Sean, and Josh, I believe, right? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so, that, so that was, um, so one guy, so basically, uh, oh, it's one weird. Was HEMA. One was one was one of my guys who what yes, I, who that's I right, that's right. and he so, was bronze and then the top two yeah, were, uh, were were you guys. So watching over the years and how how uh, short blade has evolved now these HEMA guys and uh, have really kind of like studied and not to say that they went and studied FMA they're like mm. hey I'll take you on you know um, and and they're really they're kind of analyzing that game and analyze, analyzing the footwork. Uh, and I'm analyzing how how the FMA guys move. What's funny is Sean came out with helmet, gloves, and shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> and I think I don't know who it was, but when he walked into that circle, it was a HEMA guy, and the elbow pads, shin guards. I mean, it looked like oh, okay. and, and then Sean, and then they were like, "Is is is that what you're wearing?" Sean's like, "Yeah, man, let's go." And <laughs> it's, just, it's just you know, again, the culture, the two cultures. That, that that kind of collided and you saw that and Sean did a reverse grip and you know the Hema guy had uh, I forgot who it was had a standard grip and and I'm like wait a minute he's reverse grip and Sean was just you know doing this and it was really it was really fun seeing that I want to you know, say it two was cultures the time that it was two the cultures collide and say wow let's go see this interaction over the years it's really fun seeing how 
like the Hema guys started picking up the machetes and going, I can play this game too. And then uh, the other guys going, Oh, okay, I can, I can yeah, trust more. Guys, it's it was really cool. Yeah. yeah, it was it was interesting because you could see that it was it was like what I kind of expected. I expected the FMA community, especially the uh, the PTK guys, to be better with knives. So it was my expectation. And then the mm-hmm. finalists in the in the short blades were two of my students. So when you you're, and I'm that so, was and then the one guy from took bronze from PTK. So it was a like kind of an even split. Actually, <laughs> it was actually pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Just just for the folks who are watching, and I just want to make sure I'm even clear on this. To be honest with you, um, I know the the support or the um, you guys what you guys created the coalition there is called Citadel. When you but when you guys reference short blades symposium, was that the first one that focuses just on short blades or? or? No. So the short blade symposium is the coalition of these three schools the citadel is my martial arts school here in portland Oregon. okay so i'm confusing okay 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 all right so the short blade symposium is you three guys that pull together okay i got you. so it doesn't necessarily mean you guys well are morgan, morgan can you explain short blade because i think what what even us as fma guys were like well we don't do broadsword so we decided can you explain why you chose the word short blade or some of the blades that we use right so the short blade symposium was designed as a cultural or a multicultural discipline tournament that allowed anybody that employed a blade that was 30 inches or shorter which comprises most cultures most cultures have Mm. some form of a machete that's single edged so we have a sponsor called purple heart armory and Purple Heart Armory has, so Lee is holding up a steel messer and Purple Heart Heart Armory would create a plastic messer that would be the ring tool that the fighters would use in the ring to hit each other with. Now, I'm pretty sure that the messer that Lee is holding up is a sharp and would never be used, but- Uh, No, it would be used, just not in the tournament. Well, here, here we have the uh, the steel messer that would be used in the ring for the short blade symposium, which is basically a steel representation of the sharp that, or the plastic one. So we have different representations of the same weapon that are used in the ring. And what we do is, whatever your culture is, generally each culture has some profile or pattern that specifies that it comes from them, whether it's a Chris or a Chotel, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. some, some Colombian like machete, uh, a Messer, a Ganunting for us. <clears throat> you know, so we have all these different shapes that we provide for the fighters. Uh, all they got to say is they're coming. You know, if mm-hmm. I've got a guy from Colombia or South America that says I want to fight with my Eskrima inside of the ring versus you guys. We'll make sure that he has a ring tool that accurately represents his culture. Oh, okay, as long as it's, and as long as it's 30 inches or under, correct? Correct. We usually okay. have a standardization that Lee developed yeah. uh, that comes from HEMA. He can describe that better. So just yeah, before man. we go on that note, I just want to ask, say something Belton had noted there, and he's totally right. Um, Fighting the fighting fighting his guys, all his PTK guys and Lamont's guy and Lamont and all their guys, actually did really influence our club in the way we fight. I watched those videos for hours with my coach staff, and we watched what we were doing wrong in linear fashion. So you notice in 2019 we were no longer linear fighters. We were cir- we used a lot more circles, darting in and out of angles, etc. So mm. just so you know, you were completely accurate. I did watch the videos. We poured over them. I broke down mechanics to a high degree. I was just like, how is this done? How can this improve? And how does that work from a manuscript perspective? And it opened a lot of doors. So credit to you. And I do credit you when I tell guys that uh, on, on terms of our, on terms of our school development. Yeah. But likewise too, you look at the thrusting lines from the HEMA guys are just amazing. And so some of our guys were getting caught on, on the thrust lines, um, covered, covered attacks and, uh, um, and also just leg shots. Um, I think some uh, some of the FMA guys just headhunt a lot 
and so the, the um okay. Okay. The, uh what's his name he had a um the one i the one i fought double stick against single stick and he oh john carlo yeah yeah he he was a leg hunter and someone warned me he goes you might want to put shin guards on he loves the leg shots that was me but so <laughs> i warned you yeah he said what happened hunter. what happened was i actually wasn't feeling good that day i'm like now nah, i'm just gonna sit out i'm just gonna record and um i guess i don't know who it was but we decided to go double stick against him and and Giancarlo just owned it. I mean, just he did did a really great job, and and then I, I can't help it. I'm just like, hey man, you want to go double? Because I really wanted to test the double stick against a single, and then I, you know, then there's a video and you can watch that. I did my double, then I went, I'll go single against your single, because then I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna even it up now, just because the double. I you can watch the video footage. I'll send you to YouTube, Dean, and I just wanted okay. to try it out, and uh, yeah, it was really interesting. You know, left hand on his hip. You know, very, very, uh, very sensing style, and uh, I was really aware. But I, I would use that that chicken footstep footwork to to avoid that the leg shots. I'm not eating that, you know, from him. And so, and then we, what's cool about the Hema guys, and you know, anybody, they started opening up their their mindsets to like grappling. And I asked John Carlo, I go, do you do BJJ? He's like, yeah. If we go to the ground, you want to go? He's like, yeah. And that's when we did. I did that uh, the finish on uh, the Americana or key lock, but. It was fun. It was really cool uh, watching uh, that engagement inspired me. I don't even care if I'm feeling crappy. I'm stepping double stick against single. Then I went, let me try single against single, just so I don't want to say, oh, look, I, I did that match with the double stick yeah, against yeah, the single yeah. stick. It was fun. So yeah, I'll send you that send video. I, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate that. If you could send that to me. I, I definitely yeah. would like to um, just see all that. So um, I'm just um, direct this at uh, Tuan Belton. Um, so just, you know, with your – you know, obviously coming, you know, blunt weapon translation, you know, knives and all that. Um, I know you, you just spoke on um, the fellow there, I guess his, his name is uh, John, that he's fought. Um, what were some of your, maybe your other experiences you fought and would you, what were your takeaways, you know, coming from, I guess, a totally different, uh, fighting different arts, you know, outside of FMA? If you look at my, um, some of the Philippines fights that are on YouTube or, or whatnot, I think some of the some of the guys that I went against that were very single discipline. And again, I say this with all due respect to those who do X Y Z FMA or X Y Z Escrima, whatever it is. And I'm not trying to call out any group. It's just that they 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 face that same look, you know. And so we just had I got two pro fighters are preparing for um for their 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 their, their uh, fights, and I have five am amateurs. And so we did we did a Shark Tank. So basically. Think about like tournament style, uh, sort of symposium or tip on tip on, and and one guy was was facing a guy who is a takedown artist, and then, and then the next round, so we kept him in the middle. Next round was a high level striker. The next round was a, uh, a great, you know. So when you get these different looks, and I think, and I think what I saw in the success of the guys that I that I looked at and go, man, that that's a good fighter. Is they're constantly feeding their their brain and then neurologically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, feeding their their brain. They're also getting these looks. They're constantly downloading information, and their brain's processing all these 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 experiences. When you don't spar, if you don't spar and you tap 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 stick, and then you then when once you get hit in the head and you don't modulate that threat, you have no threat modulation. You have no reaction action reaction response. Then they suck. You know, I don't care how good they look with sticks. I don't care how good they look with a drill pattern. But they've never been hit before. I can take one of my. I can. I, in fact, it has happened. Uh, Morgan, you've seen this, and I think Lee. I, I think you may have seen him. But there was a couple of guys that kind of was just stayed after after class, and we started our our short blade symposium. And one of them was a combat sambo, three time national Venezuelan champion. He's like, I'll do it. I mean, ha 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 for shits and giggles. But his range management, put a knife in his hand, was no different from a jab. So, dude, he he jabbed his way in, took the guy down, combat sample, and just da, 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 with mm. no background, a knife. So think about that for a moment. These guys are constantly getting looks and sparring, so they know how to handle range. The only difference right. is just a longer yeah. arm. It's a longer stick. It's a longer hand. So I think guys, and I call everybody out on this, you don't spar enough. You, 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 you drill. You show me your awesome freaking oh, combo, oh. your sabayan, your this, but you don't spar. You want to make yeah. it work. Pressure yeah. test there. They don't pressure yeah. test. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Lee. And at the Short Blade Symposium, primarily a lot of the FMA component is Dog Brothers or PTK. 
uh, Heavy Dog Brothers Association with Lamont Glass, Josh Rogers, you know, Robert Koenig. So we've got a lot of people from Dog Brothers. And then, of course, PTK. I'm a PTK practitioner. I created the event. My teacher is part of the event. I mean, like, it, there's a lot of PTK swirling around there. But I would like personally to see more different FMA people coming in, uh, different styles coming into this environment. It's an opportunity for them, a laboratory for them to come and have fun, you know, with a blade. I think you might, instead you know, of a stick. like if you look at the early dog buzz, the only reason I know this from a historical perspective, just because of Burton, he kind of told me what happened after night hours and yeah, yeah, and so forth. And what he said was, in his own words, so to speak, was that, you know, obviously you, you had that small individual group and a few of them were PTK, you know, uh, all that. But he goes, as it grew, some of the Bahamana guys came, some of the backyard Lameco guys came and all that. And you guys are relatively new. So I'm thinking like maybe, you know, obviously COVID didn't do you guys any favors. Oh, so, maybe, really so maybe I'm thinking a couple of years, you know, I think it, I think it'd be safe to say, I, you know, I hope so for you know, all that, but I think you would maybe would get other people once you guys get a- KI sounds room. like a great, <laughs> a great ad. I would love to see some KI practitioners come on in. Fabrizio yeah. Mincer, what's that gentleman's name? Uh, Guru Fabrizio. Yes, Fabrizio. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen people. him in gear already. He he has experience. Yeah, he has the gear. gear. He he would be more than welcome to come to our steel division as a personal invite. He, yeah, he's me. he's fenced my friend Arturo Camargo, and Camargo's probably one of the best um best single hand HEMA fencers anywhere. He's excellent, literally excellent. He's based out of Mexico. Okay, he can I give me a run for my money, and that says a lot. We can, but we can, um. Close I want to add on something from Belton said there with the sparring. He's totally right. I mean, you see it in the majority of the HEMA groups on the sparring. If they aren't if they aren't throwing down, I mean, you can see the way they're awkward in their movements. I mean, I fought a guy like probably about a year ago who said he was a badass. He didn't spar. And the first time I hit him, he looked like shocked, like a doe in the headlights. And I wasn't even hitting him hard. I mean, it's like 20%. I mean, I, I ramped it up when he tried to double me, but that's after that he he learned he learned the hard way. But I'll yeah. add in something else, man. That is something mm. we should probably talk about. And that's cutting. I look at cutting as part of the triangulation of training. If you're drilling, your physical conditioning, that's important, very important. You have you have your sparring. This is also important. But you have your cutting, and it's going to be interesting to say I can t I can go anywhere in different martial arts to do weapons. I can put a water bottle in a stand. And 50% will fail a cut on a water bottle with a razor sharp sword. And Belton and, and, and Morgan will test. Like my messer, it is shaving sharp. Literally shaving sharp. It goes through medium like nothing. I can I could take a I take a deer's head off with it with one cut after I've hunted. Like just easy. No problem. But that's what I mean about cutting. It's about testing on medium. If you can cut medium when we're moving, I want you to consider that every time the blade, and I study this a lot because I cut a lot, every time the blade angles even slightly off of its alignment off of and, and is no longer within human skeletal alignment what ends up happening is the edge will turn so when it hits medium it turns and sticks if you do it properly the blade will go through without any problem and that also mm -hmm. means the point of percussion has to be accurate a cut if a flawless cut for example i use water bottles because they're cheap i go to costco get them for four cents a cut my preferred medium is tatami that's twelve dollars a mat which works out if i'm cutting conservatively eight cuts, so a buck 25, buck 50 a cut. Pretty expensive um, by comparison, but you can practice him things on water balls. I practice on various mediums. I like to test this stuff. But mm. I, for example, um, we were talking about the Hema protective gear. We have a thing, a heavy pad jacket that built in the top earlier called a spec jacket. We want to test our skills. It's essentially like a thick gambeson, two, three layers, lots of fabric. We put the sleeve over top of a um, tatami mat, and I can cut through that with a long sword clean. So it gives you an example of like, when I talk about cutting as a medium test, if more people did cutting, I think that would also be that end of that triangulation. So you have your physical training, you have your, dr and we include your drilling, you have your sparring and your coach sparring your and, and video feedback, and then you have your cutting and video feedback. And I would say yeah. that would make a strong triangulation of training for pretty much anyone in a weapons arc. If anyone I can else? interject, I mean, if you're, if you're teaching a bladed art and you are not incorporating cutting training, that would be equivalent to teaching somebody how to shoot a gun, but never giving them bullets. 
So cutting is extremely important, especially coming from a Japanese martial arts background. And one of the arts that I train in and that I'm certified in is called Shinkendo. And cutting is what's called Tamishigiri Shizan is deeply ingrained mm. in that training. And it's something that HEMA has adopted. Uh, traditionally, HEMA and the European, they would cut clay or they would cut carcasses of animals and things like that. They wouldn't use tatami mat. Tatami mat originally was not meant to test the skill of the cutter. It was meant to test a sword. So it's been adopted as that medium as time has gone has gone on and has been something that HEMA used regularly in its cutting tournaments. But FMA, um, in terms of cutting, in the early 90s, Lynn Thompson was doing a lot of demonstrational cutting, but he wasn't hosting judged cr events where you're, you were being judged on your criteria of your cut. Whereas in HEMA, they started doing that, I would say, in the early teens, 2016, 2015? No, not true. Um, not 20, no. 20, 2009, Mike Edelson. 2009. So even earlier, they started adopting. And he comes from a Japanese cutting background. He's quite skilled. Right. So he could he could explain a little bit better on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, um... Dalton, what's your thoughts? Curious. About, about cutting? Cutting. Uh, I think everything you mentioned is, is right on. You know, um, even like the Sayok guys, um, I went and trained at a Sayok camp. Um, and I was one of maybe two non Sayok guys or three. And <laughs> they put a, we put a pig up and put a, a sweatshirt and a leather jacket on. Those are the funniest thing. So I think they told us to line up and said, you know, go ahead and grab whatever you want and have at it. A couple of guys, you know, that Bowie knives and they had, they had whatever they were carrying. And I'm, and I'm looking at some of these guys and granted some of them were new, but they were like coming at it with a jacket and, I was just standing there, and I pulled out my folder, and I just went, poof, 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 poof. <laughs> and the instructor goes, I think Belton gets it. I was like, yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, so you, want, you, you, you puncture and penetrate live meat. You slice dead meat. So, I mean, you know, if I'm going to kill someone, and, I mean, I'm going off the subject here. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to stab. I'm, so I'm, I'm a fan of stabbing. I'm a fan of puncturing. If it's, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to go up there. I'm not going to go. I'm going to slice a bear to death. I'm going to put an arrow through it, a bullet, or I'm going to stab its mm -hmm. freaking eye out or its brain. So that's why I love reverse grips. So I think cutting and understanding. I mean, I had what a four inch blade. I went right through the leather jacket, through the sweatshirt, bop, 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 right into live flesh, you know, and uh, that feels different. Uh, I've, I've, it definitely feels different when you're stabbed. I mean, I've, I've been stabbed, I've been cut, and stabbing sucks. I mean, it does not feel good. Yeah. Anyway, that's my opinion. So I think uh, learning, learning that and learning the mediums, um, trying it on live flesh is also different. I'm, I mean, and I say flesh, I'm not talking, just take my word for it, flesh. It could be pig, right? So it's, yeah. well, it's different. You know? the, the Piper system also, did, they, 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 I think I've heard Nigel say uh, butchers yeah. and people that work with putting an edge through meat and medium have a different level of, uh, understanding of what cutting really means. I've worked for, for 30 years as a sushi chef. So, Dean, Dean, Dean can probably elaborate on that. I mean, you have right. uh, done Piper. Right. Uh, yeah, you know, that, they prefer man. screwdrivers, sharp and rusty, pointy things rather than the, sh the sharper actually doesn't really matter. It's probably worse yeah. at handling handling a sharp blade, you know? Yeah. And then I also did, as well as you experienced with the Sayox, the, the cutting of the uh, Oh my God! Way back, I think it was like early two thousands, right? Um, long, long time ago. Did you? Have, hey, Bell, do you want to know, Did they ever ask you to anything with the wild boars? Um, now, now we're now we're really getting off subject here. My apologies. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so at this camp, um, I declined. They, they, yeah, yeah, no. At this camp, I'll I'll, I'll get off. I'll, I'll just I'll just give a going back to sparring. But they actually wanted to see me spar. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to totally just leave any names or anything out of it. And they made a circle and, uh, you know, I was like, oh shit, you know, I, and you, 
you just know when you don't belong. And they're like, let's go with Belton and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's their top guy. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's do it. And um, yeah, I, I put him, I bloodied his nose. I cracked his nose open and uh, we didn't have headgear. So we went, okay. The, I went through four of their guys. And the only guy that took me out uh, on a shot that we, we stopped was, uh, was an Santo guy. It was, uh, you know, so it was an Santo guy that, that took me out because I got disarmed. And then I just went for a tackle and he just went pop in the head. And we said uh, one headshot and you're done. So it was, it was a different rule set, but it was hand targeting. It was fun. A lot of leg targeting. And, but that, the, I, I, but he, I flicked his, his nose, the first guy. And then every other guy just was just head hunting them. So, yeah, but it's all set up. But, but that was uh, very interesting. I mean, that camp was definitely fun. You know, we threw knives, mm. we did this, we did cutting. The pig thing, yes, definitely. Yes, fun yeah, times. You know, it's funny. It'd be nice all of us to talk behind closed doors one day because I can give you other stories. And I'm not surprised. I hope this doesn't come back to bite me. But because we mentioned the tip on tip on is, we've we've controlled that environment to where everybody is is you know we're amicable and we're like, hey, we want to learn from each other, you know. So there's there's no ego. I mean, we had that guy from africa man that was really cool watching him that was Mondo cool him and jesse's final was pretty cool i posted that up on the fma discussion okay but who was the african what was the style what was the african um, guy? it's um historical african martial arts oh man that was he beautiful actually work. is a, a conglomeration of a lot of north african styles he likes yeah, to practice really cool. egyptian stick arts and yeah what was his what was his blade what would he use what, what did he tell? Tell? it was the uh, was the curved show tell Oh man, yeah, that was awesome watching him work. So now there was a lot of contention. I noticed in that's the like comments, good noon ting. There was a lot of contention there, you know. about uh, some of the African practitioners as to why in the finals he was using it with the edge facing this way, where traditionally they would fight as a sickle shape, and uh, we had to clarify that he was free to use it any way he wanted. We just didn't want him to switch in the middle of the round to be able to switch his grip from one edge to the other and, and switch the grip from being, uh, you know, a main edge to a sickle to a false edge all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and which is very easy to do with this weapon and its handle structure. You can close the whip right out of my looking hand. Back, anyway. Looking back, Morgan, we could have done that because the Messer also is a false edge. Right. We made that rule to be one edge because some of the weapons that in the like the Gununting, for example, doesn't have the false edge, so we're Actually, making it, it even also. for everyone. Actually, so we, the Gununting has a, a false edge also. All the ones you guys have shown me, I've never seen a false edge on one. So, gotcha. Okay, hey guys, I'm gonna we, show the We've bit. stuck pretty much to a single huh? edge weapon. I'm gonna show the bit. Um, uh, just so folks can kind of see um, what you guys are about. So I'm going to have to lower myself just temporarily. And then um, so I'm going to disappear for I'm just going to be on the bottom, though. And then I'll, uh, I'll show the video.
this has got a nice frame look on it. Oh, look yeah. at that frame look. Look at that. Look at the meat on that. That's, the cover is such a nice color. What is this for? This is for first place for, for the Messer event. event. This grip is so comfortable. Okay, real quick picture. Show that knife, show that knife. There you go. Okay. All right, that was pretty neat. Who, um, you guys all kind of collaborated on that? That was pretty neat. Oh, I didn't. I, 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 I was like, that's cool. I, that's I support actually everybody created working. by Tuhan Belton. He, he made oh, that. Oh, Belton, yours? Awesome job. Yeah, he made oh, that wow. in 2018. No that was one. one of our best years. So, let's, uh, just for folks, so when was the, what was the, what was the year you did the first one, 219? 2017 was year one. Oh. That's right. Oh, okay. That's the first one he did. Okay. And then, so you guys had to stop at, after 2019? 19 was our last one. Gotcha. 2020, we had planned on doing a steel division. We had a lot of plans to make some announcements. And then, of course, everything happened. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so just for folks are watching, like, uh, how, what were some of the um, changes that from the first one you did 2017 to the one you did down 2019? Would you guys keep it pretty much consistent? And were there improvements or added, you know, brackets or what have you? Hon honestly, everything's worked out really well. This is kind of the old, we added a few uh, different moves, a different, couple different things, like a knife, a basically weapon arm target went up in value. But other than that, it's a very that's a very small change. It didn't. It's not really like a very large change. It's just you double mm. the weapon arm value versus the offhand value, and really that's not very much. Um, we've had cut. I believe we've had covered thrust in the entire time. That's been yes, like a real staple. The so time. the covered thrust rule has never really changed. So I mean, it's kind of the old adage: if it's not broke. Don't fix yeah, it. I mean, if you play with it too much, you can lose the magic. If something needs to be changed, like the weapon arm rule, that's really about the only rule I think we really added in. The um, tournament structure is really not broken down in divisions of weight or class or anything like that. We have what we call open pools, where pools of fighters are grouped together and they pretty much fight around Robin to fight their way out of the pools into the semifinals and then the finals. Yeah, we don't even so have a women's division. We, it's just open. Uh, we've been pretty much co oh, okay. the entire time. Most of the fighters that we have that are women prefer to fight against the men and do not mm -hmm. want to be differentiated against. I yeah, do realize Matt, that as we grow, there might be women that want their own division, and I would be welcome to that, and yeah. also youth divisions. But right now we're doing just we're so small and it's such a niche environment that it's just a, an open division. We say yeah. open, like in other words, so uh, current. I mean, status quo. You're not basing anything like, uh, for instance, uh, age, uh, weight class, experience. It, it, you go there, man. Who knows who you're gonna go up against? Is that fair? Correct. Okay. Okay. Correct. Okay. And um, as far um, how in the um, feedback's been. Relatively all positive and everything. Yeah. So far, excuse me, I didn't hear that question. I'm sorry. What feedback's been positive thus far? From fighters, yeah. I'm, we've never mm -hmm. had any complaints over judging. Most certainly, I have a great cadre of prize sponsors that range from Purple Heart Armory, traditional Filipino weapons, Bastinelli knives. We've had Cold Steel. It's oh, wow. been like a mini blade show at some of our events, like. Kelly Warden, yeah, What's Kelly that? yeah, Dr. Kelly nice. Warden has Warden. given um, more than plenty on uh, multiple years. So we have a lot of sponsors that return. We've had some sponsors that um, are only there for a year. So basically, my sponsors cadre is gold, silver, and bronze. All of our gold sponsors. How far is your placements? Okay, okay, okay. Our gold sponsors are people who have sponsored us throughout the entirety of our career silver sponsors are two or more years and then bronze mm -hmm. sponsors are their first year sponsoring us so how many brackets do you currently like how many brackets are there or i mean when they go there is it is it all just one bracket because it's all 30 inches or under or is there so, do you have separate? actually
actually at the event is broken down into a three ring circus of three events. We have the machete class, we have the knife class, and then oh. we have the cutting tournament. So oh, okay. each one of these tournaments is a mini tournament within itself where fighters fight within the machete class to find who's first place in machete. Mm. And then we have, we do the same event for the knife class and then for the cutting event. So the tournament is a mixture of three events. Okay, okay. Oh, neat. And, and, and within the, the winners of the, of the three events, there you got like a, what, a first, second, third kind of placements or? Help. Standard. Oh, all right, standard. Okay. All right. All right. We've uh, our sponsor has been providing medals for the uh, podium, and we always have been pretty, pretty well known for giving away some pretty outstanding prizes. Mm. Traditional fi Filipino weapons in 2019 provided us with like a banyal, a tengere, a, a, oh, a Ron? bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah. Mean, like, yeah. He, he supplied a bunch of cool stuff. Um, Traditional Filipino weapons, or excuse me, uh, Purple Heart Armory has always supplied us mm. with everything that the event is run on, from the tournament ring to the judges' tools to the fight tools. So, and obviously prize support. So we have a lot of people that um, Guru Mark Denny gave us a uh, Shiba 1.5, one of those tactical ring daggers that he was making, the Akitas or whatever, the Shiba, the smaller one, I think. Okay. So we've been we've been very fortunate in our sponsors cadre to have a lot of people give to our fighters. So literally, no one's ever complained to us about anything. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what do you recommend for? Got a question here for you guys um, from Robert Schooning. What do you recommend for cut for cutting training? I see people using mats, clay, water, bottles. All right. Kind of went over. You want me? All right. I cut a lot, so I might as well answer this one. I think clay is useless, personally. Um, I'm very blunt. Um, uh, honestly, I think for cheap, for your best bang for buck, you look at water bottles. They're cheap. They're standardized. The big thing I say is standardization. You want something standardized that you can look at and see your edge alignment as you cut. You want if you if you see a nice edge alignment through, if you see tearing of the bottle, you can do a lot with a water bottle, more than most people think they can do it do with it. When when you look at go to Costco, even with the posit, you look at an eight dollar flat of forty cuts, it's pretty hard to beat that in terms of, of cost. Um, when it comes to tatami, I think tatami mat is still like the best standardized cutting target. I have not found better yet. And I mean I can roll it in doubles if I need to. I can set up different stands. I've done a triple. I've done what they call a triple double in tournament, which is essentially three mats lined up and cut through the bottom, cut through the tops before they all fall. It's on the Combat Con website. It's like 2018, I think. I did that during the final, and uh, just with a double triple, it's pretty hard. But the mats allow for that those kinds of those complex cutting feats, so they're quite good because there's a lot of them are standardized. Um, animal carcass. Uh, I mean, fresh animal carcass is better than dead animal carcass. The bone calcifies quickly, so if I'm hunting, maybe I'll do a head off. Maybe I'll take an arm or a paw off if I'm hunting, if I'm hunting bear or I'm hunting deer. But I will tell you that the bone does calcify quickly. You're looking at like an hour, two hours tops for before the bone becomes very hard. And that could damage your edge on a dead animal. It's way different than cutting a live animal. Oh, um, Delton might have touched on that earlier. But if you look at it from a perspective, the, when, the, when the bone is still alive, it's still wet, it still cuts fairly easy. If you, try, if you hang that animal for a day and you try cutting it, it's going to give you a different result. So mm. budget-friendly, for budget-friendly, though, you can't beat the beat water. water. <laughs> Anyone else want to add in? Um, I, I obviously favor tatami because that's traditionally what we would cut with in Shinkendo and what we're cutting with in Hima. Um, I'm not a fan of water bottles, but Lee cuts more water bottles than I do, so he's going to get more feedback from that medium than I ever would. Um, I would say another option is to go to the dollar store and get a pool noodle because it's similar to the structure of a tatami mat, but it doesn't match the density in any way shape or form so pool noodle is an option but not a good one uh, so i will always be sticking with tatami as my preferred cutting medium 
you're making that crypto money, Morgan. If you're going to afford to Tommy these days, you're looking at ten bucks a mat. Selling all your Dogecoin for Tommy. Yeah. What do you think? To get back up there, uh, I almost choked right 40, there. Forty thousand. Yeah. There's a whole other uh, topic on huh? crypto. <laughs> uh, all right. So what? Um. Okay. Before we get into the show aspect of you guys showing the gear, um. So, uh, lost my place there. Bear with me. Um, let's go. Yeah, for uh, Tuan Belton. So, I mean, uh, you touched on this a bit. Like, uh, how many? Like, how many guys did you go against? Uh, I know. I know you talked about the leg guy there. Did you go against a few others? Yeah, Lamont and I went. Uh, Kai and I went. Uh, oh, wait, that's. Sorry, that's too fun. I'm confusing the tournaments. My bad. Um, I was judging a lot. I'm sure I played some. Are you, are you, okay, to be, okay. I was judging and refereeing a lot. Um, but uh, who did I – did I go against anybody? At Desmond Short Blade Symposium? No, yeah. you're, you're always fighting at tip on tip on. Short Blade Symposium, you're working. Yeah, I'm judging a lot in, in uh, Short Blade. How do you, um, right. you enjoy the judging? Let's talk about that. How about the judging? It's, I mean, you know, Lee, Lee can probably tell you that because uh, I was like, hey, how did I do uh, judging uh, when it comes to, you know, like HEMA and all that stuff? He, he says, dude, a lot better than a lot of judges he knows. I mean, at least that's what you told me. Um, so I, He is because he, he can see fights. There's a big yeah. difference you have to understand. It's not a very nice thing to say to the rest of the HEMA community, but I'm – I'm I'm a bastard, so whatever. Uh, but I did tell people this, and they got pretty offended by it. Eric. What do you mean he judges better than me? I'm like, well, because Belton understands fighting, and this is a really key thing in judging. I can tell you from experience. If you take a guy who's or a person, anyone who's never doesn't fight and doesn't fight often, and then you put them in a judge ring, they are literally a post turtle. And when I say post turtle, you see a turtle in a post, and you wonder how it got there. And you don't really know why it's there, so someone clearly put it there. That's what I mean by a post turtle. And you see these people in, in the HEMA community judging, and it's not very nice to say again because they're volunteers. It's tough to find judges and bodies, but there's, it doesn't work, right? So I take Belton, who has never, ever, I just got a coffee, um, who has never, ever judged HEMA or any rule set like this before, and he just like kicks ass at it and is extremely good, very, very accurate. And that was, and I had a theory on this that if you understand fighting mm -hmm. and you understand like footwork, you understand how the fight progresses. You can see that fight progress, and you're going to know approximately the same time when the other person's blow hits, just by being able to see the, and read the fight. Yeah, so Belton, be able to because he's right? able to, to fight really well, and he has, and he's trained a lot of good fighters. He sees the fight. I can just give him the rules, and he can judge it. It's very, mm -hmm. very easy. But that is a fighter. That is a fighter mentality, right? And that's what I, that's, mm -hmm. so even like when I ha run HEMA tournaments, if someone volunteers for judging and they can't fight, I put them on table. And they're useful mm -hmm. on table, which is good because they got to calculate scores and, and run timing. And that's just how it has to be. But you put my, my, best, my best judges, no matter where I go, what tournament I'm running, they're all accomplished fighters. In one aspect or another, yeah, that makes sense. I can, I can, and also, I, can I, I think uh, having ref fights, actual like combat sport, like Muay Thai, kickboxing, MMA, and stuff like that, uh, sitting there as a cornerman coach and looking at angles. When you when you ref a fight, you got to triangulate with the guys. They're, they're, so you gotta you gotta find that angle to be still within the fight to be able to protect the fighter to keep the show going on. And so having to move with them. You have to look for a lot of things, and your your brain's processing so much. You got a ring behind you, or I'm sorry, ropes or a cage. You're so training myself to do that, and and seeing movement and catching movement quick is uh, uh it, it was easy to pick up. And then if I'm a cornerman, I'm watching my fighter. I call out stuff. I'm like, look, watch, watch, watch the lead leg. He's having his lead leg. Da, 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 da. You know, his left hand drops. Da, da, da. You know, so I'm calling out stuff that I'm seeing because I'm another pair of eyes. He's the one in the middle of the fight. I'm not, so I'm not stressed in, in that term. So I see everything, and having that eye, I was like, it was too. It was. I mean, I shouldn't. Say, it was easy to judge. It was relatively easy compared to if I didn't have that experience. And I think Lee just kind of justified that, or I, I asked for feedback because I, I can always learn. And he was like, no, you did great. And I was like, cool. So I, I would say also the, 
the hardest the hardest event to judge in our tournament is the knife because it's so short. <laughs> yeah, and generally it's tracking, black, yeah, so tracking. it's really hard to see, and the engagements get yeah, really tracking. Hard. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So unless you're really experienced and have an eye like Belton, Lee, or many of the other judges that I've chosen or that they've chosen, you know, it, that's the hardest one to judge because the you know the distance and the measure yeah, I know. It's the, I and, and, pa and pant rate of depth right you gotta understand like guys like belton and i we don't call a little touch if that mm. if that blade doesn't sink we don't the know where's the, the contact we're you looking for contact and, and you'll and if you watch the tournaments closely you'll see him and i as we get more tired go from like not no keep fighting being like polite and then once we get tired you hear weak weak <laughs> <laughs> So, it's true because the two of us are just we're just so tired by like the end of it. Yeah. In terms of the in terms of the criteria <laughs> of um, the judging though, like especially like in terms of the thrust, let's say in the knife event, it's really hard to see um, the flex of one of those blades. So generally what they're looking for, especially like in a mask hit, you'll see the travel of the head move back when a thrust so really for, takes yeah. a solid okay. hit. To the torso, generally these blades, the cold steel rubber knives that we're using, generally as a standard, we use the cold steel Bowie trainer. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes when that flexes, if it flexes too strongly at the hill, we've literally snapped three or four blades um, in 2018 because Jesse Tucker, one of uh, Lee's fighters, Superman thrusts into his opponents and you know it's a penetrating thrust. You know that it's 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 not insufficient. And in terms about, of um, deficiency, huh? before before the event, Lee demonstrates what are insufficient strikes and okay. what are sufficient strikes with the weapon systems that are used, whether it's a Bowie knife or okay, a so machete. Know. Okay. Right. We display what insufficient strikes do to a tatami target. And what a sufficient strike does. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like Belton already touched on it earlier with the with the carcass and the jacket. Mm. I mean, we if you if you know, you know, you know what the you know what the thrust is going to do, mm. right? If a, a little a little love a little love tap thrust is not going to do that much. Like, I mean, I have a degree in a associate degree in health sciences. I was pre med, and I mean, we discussed this. I was talking to one of my my friends. Who is an emergency room doctor? He calls me on the phone. He's like, "Man, I had a rough shift." I'm like, "Well, what what's wrong?" He goes, "Oh, there's a eight man knife fight in Vancouver." And I'm like, "Oh, well, how many of them died?" He's like, "None." I'm like, "Oh, what was the pantry of depth?" He's like, "Oh, one and a half inches on average." One person, one person got the knife in the in the belly, and that was about it. Um, but uh, most of them just had little little stab wounds, mostly stitches and clean out wound. I'm like, oh, he's like, "Do you think these guys had training?" I'm like, "Oh, definitely not." Is it what if they had training? I'm like, well, most of them be in the morgue. Yeah. Right. What about um? How do you guys the lens like uh, as far as hand and arm shot? Same thing. It's got to be a resounding impact. I mean, something that you can take. Be... This is this is a this is a misnomer too. I'll, I'll I'll go through it from a medical perspective. A little little taps you can take them. I've been stabbed. I mean, you can take them. You can keep fighting. What you can't take is when you when when someone severs a muscle group. No, so if you're to look at like if you're to look at like um a poke like a bicep mm -hmm. poke, you might fight through it still. Like it depends. Like if you really rip the muscle and you have a good mm -hmm. cavitation, maybe not. But I mean, if you sever this from here to here with like a bowie knife, yeah. you probably aren't going to use it. I mean, no, you got to no, look no. at it from that perspective. If you if you if you destroy the machine, then the machine doesn't work anymore. We try to like go from that realism. But just like we were talking about the, the thrust, if you punch that through through the through the, essentially the heart, the, you punch that through the lungs, yeah, you right, punch right, that right. up into the spleen. I mean, it's done. It's going to be done. Like no, I mean, no, no. You especially make a big hole, it's going to gush. Okay. So, um, all right. I think we're ready, man. I think we're ready for the show. So, what do you guys got to show as far as the gear and weapons of choice? So, in terms of the ring tools, I possess most of the the ring tools and the ring and all that, and that's all synthetic weapons or the new steel messers that we have. I'm sure Lee has a presentation of some oh, protective gear that we I got use. something Belton's so gonna want to do that. Why don't, why don't I have Lee oh, show I'll off put it on. Gear. I'm testing these right now on the Canadian distributor for them, but the American distributor is Purple Heart. So this is the new Pro Gauntlet. 
Mm. So this is synthetic. I can take a full steel hit to the hand, not break it. And I've broken my hand so a lot of times. I've been using a heavy steel saber lately. So this here, new pro gauntlet, a full ability. I can actually use it. I can use all my finger work, which actually works pretty well. You can see it. You can Google it, pro, pro gauntlet's what it's called. But um, it's a, basically a light glove construction. It kind of looks like a Batman glove. Um, when I, I, I've hung out with the, uh, the developer for it, help fund the development for it. And this is this saber here. I've been fighting with this lately. It's a wide Polish Polish style saber. And it does hit like a truck. It hits very, very, very hard. I mean, no joke. I come I'm sparring with Steve in the garage in our in our new cell in the we, we renovated our garage to a cell. Steve is like my my number two guy and we fight with these and we come back beat up. It's definitely enjoyable, but at the same time it hurts. But when I say that, I say that this here is is the game changer. Before that, we had like lacrosse gloves and hockey gloves, but this will be the game man. changer. And I broke my fingers so many times. I mean, it's not even funny. None How much are those? Things. How much? Oh, I think they're about five hundred US. But I mean, I always think it like this: worth, like, yeah. what's your fingers worth? What's recovery on your fingers injuries. worth? I mean, what every every finger injury I've had is like. Is like a month out on that hand. No, he's look at Belton. Belton's he's thinking about her right now. He's just in five hundred. That's a lot of hockey gloves. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? A hockey glove doesn't protect you against steel, man. No, I know, I know. Against steel, I know. Against steel, man. When you're fighting steel, and there's nothing like fighting steel. Like when you go to steel, and that's kind of it's uh, hard to go back to anything of, else. It's it's good. Gloves like gloves that he's those those type of gloves that he's displaying. Will yeah. be required for the steel division. Yeah, you guys got covered. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, these are the common ones you'll see. This is a spec gauntlet, spec heavy. That's mine. It's that's why it's beat up. Um, but I mean, the spec heavy is pretty much the HEMA standard for glove. It'll take mm -hmm. a full long sword hit. Um, uh, basically, a long sword you'd say probably three and a half, four pounds, at uh, full force will take a full mm -hmm. hit and you won't break your fingers. Which I mean is something special because I mean. Usually long sword finger injuries are the big one and knee injuries are the other one. Yeah. Um, normally we're fighting here in the heat, usually single sticks. Okay. There's a mechanic stick I was talking about, basket hilt. That just a hockey glove is fine. Even a lacrosse, a lacrosse glove more commonly, commonly used. But for pro gauntlet, things like this, side sword. Mm. I have rapiers as well. Um, this is common. This is interesting. What's that? This, this here is an elbow guard, plastic elbow guard, and a forearm guard. And one of the things we found fighting steel is that the ulna breaks. Oh, yeah, there's been a few broken, not in my school, because we adopted these earlier. <laughs> Just going to say that, right? But it's, at a couple of the major tournaments in Europe, they had some, like, they had some, uh, like, straight up, like, full breaks. A guy did, a, like, a sideways horizontal cut called workout right to the arm. The guy stepped into it, shattered the arm. Oh man! So we and we have broken these in our school. Just so we're clear, these are these are like hard plastic plate with foam underneath. Mm -hmm. um, we have shattered these in our school, and if they sh this shatters, that would have broke your arm. Yeah, so shattered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These yeah. these are a theory. These are ethereal. You just accept that they're going to break eventually, but they're low cost, or like fifty bucks. So are they all the same? That, same company. Huh? Same company. Uh, that's Spess. Spess or oh, Superior okay. Fencing. Okay. Um, here, this is something that I really like, and it's a nice crossover. This is called a sparring hoodie. I showed Belt in it before. It essentially is an armored hoodie, like a motorcycle hoodie. Okay. And, and what it does is it allows us basically, like, pen, like the, the new ones uh, that I have, allow us um, essentially penetrate of, if the sword breaks, it basically penetration resistance. So you break a sword, you don't, it doesn't go through you like what happened to me um, a long time ago. Um, at the same time, it's good as a good armor base, right? So I would look at it like from that perspective, that's a nice FMA crossover where you're not over gearing at the same time. Cause I don't really like the HEMA stuff where everybody's like, looks like they're in plastic straight armor. I think there has oh, to be a limit to your armor, the amount of armor you have. Otherwise, cause I, gr I agree with the dog brothers in that sense where there has to be a little limit really. Otherwise you're just an armored tank and you're not no, afraid of the weapon. No, I guess that was you start. Uh, they're they, um they compare I guess it's weak calf I, I think they kind of mention sometimes you know fully padded up and all that but uh 
Oh, we, I got ooh, another question. Another question from my uh, good friend El Elric. Can you guys talk more about the difference between rattan, synthetic, and steel? I think most FMA folks don't get the difference or think it doesn't matter. Please talk about the difference in technique. So, when I originally conceptualized, can I just say, can I just say one comment, Morgan? Yes, please, please go you ahead. Can. Tell the FMA guy to to wittick with steel. Let's see what happens to his wrist. <laughs> what this? Go ahead, go. Oh, right, so, with the um, steel, huh? Yeah, the, the weight of steel is not the same, and it will no. carry you. You'll stretch your wrist out unless you've done considerable training. Of course, power training against the tire and doing your wittiks, that's going to build your wrist strength. So you're going to build some level of control to control. But unless you do that with steel regularly, you're not going to be ready for it. And if you're always practicing with a stick and you yes. just think you're going to wittik somebody with a ganunting, no, you don't yeah. think again. Uh, what you're saying is wittik is coming in like this. It's like this kind of thing. Kind of a, kind of a fanning motion. A fanning I mean, motion. So in, which, in, which, in which direction does the edge go? Uh, it's, it's, it's more of a slap. It's more of a slap, it's a slap with the flat of the blade. Oh, you can slap with the flat of the blade at the master. It just requires a, a grip change. No, so you yeah, use a grip. You'd use this thumb grip style, and then you then your wrist would be in the proper alignment to make this called a exactly. prowl how with a long sword. I mean, you could yeah, call you could I'm, prowl I'm how talking, with a sharp. I'm talking how the Filipino martial arts guys do that. They full swing right into a flap. You know, oh, what happens is oh, they get they okay. get very very uh, quick and fancy, and the same the same technique will not apply in, in steel. They're gonna oh, whack because no. I because I've done it. I've done. I've grabbed steel and I went, "Ooh, this is cool!" And I went, "Whoop!" And I was like, "Oh, mother!" Oh, I was like, "Dude, it hurts." <laughs> yeah, just feeling your wrist, your elbow, just the, the the structure of your arm can't handle that so many pounds. Yeah. I was just like, I was just messing with it, and I was like, "This is heavy!" And I was like, "Whoop!" And I was like, "Yeah, that doesn't feel good." So, no. I, I, yeah. yeah. Anyway, you so know what I mean. Now I know what you mean. Now it's like, yeah, yeah. So I noticed that a lot of FMA events. You know, in a lot of FMA styles were blade arts, but when they would fight, they would fight with sticks, which is a round geometry and doesn't have edge geometry. So you weren't you know, really, you didn't have a sense of where the edge was versus where the flat was. So when you're doing with ticks and you're claiming it's a cut, you can see in the structure that it wasn't. So taking that round geometry out of the FMA fighter's hand and putting something that is synthetic and that has an edge geometry to it would would force them to rethink the way that they train a bladed art. And then another layer of that was what, you know, Belton is referring to. And I'm sure that uh, Lee here has something that he wants to say. Okay, I uh, I now I'm understanding because I'm trying I'm just trying to think back from what I saw. I'm thinking back to Belton moving, everybody else moving with the sticks. I'm thinking back to um, I'm thinking back to tip on tip on actually. And um, a big misconception, especially in weapon arts, is that there's one grip, and that's a really important thing. And we go into it in HEMA, but not many HEMA schools talk about this. So I'll talk about it. It's fun. Um, you have one grip, and most people you see do this style of grip here with hammer grip. Some people like me, we work mostly handshake. Aim like fast cuts. Belton see me fight, so he knows what I'm talking about. My really fast cuts are because what I'll end up doing is I switch my grip repeatedly, and it's all hand work. So something like a Mesa, for example, which is the closest thing I have on my hand to my longsword in terms of grip mechanics, I have my parry grip, which is my hammer grip. I have my cutting grip, which, sorry, I did, I did my camera in here. My camera's reversed, so I'm trying to find it. This is my handshake grip, so I actually extend it. Now my wrist is in this alignment form mm. profile. Then if I want to go to like what you call that what tick type of thing, which I wouldn't do with the flat, I'd do with the edge, I'd reverse my profile here, and this is a thumb grip. This is something we really only see in the HEMA community, and this is right. used for doing the false edge cut. So if you ever see me doing like Dean's on my Facebook friends list, so if you ever see me post like video of me cutting, you'll see me do false edge cuts. This happens as I cut, boom, I turn my false edge in. And now I'm in a different grip profile. It allows my it allows my edge to hit exactly where I want to hit. The amount of practice it takes for grip training like that to land accurately and change from from parrying grip to cutting grip. So I would look at like hand hammer grip, parrying grip. The, the easiest way of putting it. It's not necessarily exact, but the lay in layman's terms, hammer grip, parrying grip, cutting grip, handshake grip, thumb grip, false edges. Tra traditionally in Pikiti, the way that I've been taught is that when 
you're holding a bladed weapon, your second line of knuckles is what aligns with the blade. So when you're holding a round object, when I'm striking out, if my wrist is canted, now I'm presenting that second line of knuckles. So now I know that my stick is oriented pr properly so that I know I'm presenting my edge and not the flat of my blade. So very much so in the striking structure and striking mechanics during the fight, the judges that are experienced in this kind of knowledge know what they're looking for. So if you're judging a stick fighting match, you know that this structure of the hand, if this, if my hand is not canted and my hand is straight, that I'm throwing my edge off to the right and not presenting it straight onto my target. So in HEMA, what he's talking about is that now we're changing that alignment of that knuckle line from the bladed edge. So now the bladed edge is flat so that when he's presenting the blade this way on a horizontal plane doing a boutique, can also be diagonal plane. striking and not the flat of the blade striking the opponent on the side of the head or slapping them in the ear or something like that. Also, Does Morgan, that make you sense? understand this horizontal plane, as you see it, is actually a diagonal plane in this in this in this orientation, and it, and it works well with a diagonal plane false edge here, and it can be moved to use this edge as well as a weaker cut. But this, like with a long sword, it's a shield house essentially, and this is work, the classic Hema's work you see, and that works. In, but they're still working on diagonal lines. So, um, to answer Elric, uh, if he's still on there. Um, um, when when I went to Philippines, I think 2000, I forgot, it was 15 or 14, Grand Tone uh, basically gave everybody, there was, uh, there was 12 of us. That's why he called it a tribe of 12. And he said, this is your gununting. You will carry this wherever you go. You sleep with it. You, you So we did. You know, we trained everywhere, but we always had our gununting. And when you get into 2,000 strikes, if you don't pull through and that steel, and some of these guys, when they had their stick, and then they kind of short exit, um, it, you pay the price, you know, your, 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 your body mechanics changes when you actually, actually have weight behind your stick and behind your steel. So to answer, I think you said, talk the difference between the synthetic, the rattan and steel. Um, and then you got these trainer, trainer swords or, you know, they're, 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 they're dense plastic and, or they're aluminum. Sometimes guys, uh, and I say FMA guys still kind of treat it stick ish. They don't really treat it as steel. Then when you go to steel, they're like, oh, God, I really got to pull through and use my rotation to come back. And so mm -hmm. I think it's important, you know, I think people, FMA folks, you're right, uh, Elric, FMA guys don't get the difference. And they think it doesn't matter. It will matter. And if they don't find out, they'll find out later or find out the hard way. Their shoulder, their elbow, their wrist structure, everything will be, um, everything will be compensated. And I think sometimes... The fast stuff, and don't get me wrong, I mean, man, I love all that stuff too, but FMA guys either got to decide, am I treating this as a blade or am I treating it as an impact yeah, weapon? Yeah. Sometimes they, they act like the impact weapon is still the blade, and, well, you know, the stick is the blade. No, it's a stick in your hand, dude. Just just treat it like a stick and, and whack and hit, you know, or with tick or whatever. Or if you want to play blade, and, yeah, follow through with the movements, but then grab your trainer and grab your live blade and actually move it around. When we're up there in the jungles and it's wet grass in the morning at 5 a.m. and Grand Tour is telling me stop, stop pivoting, because I know you're a fighter. You pivot, and and when you're swinging steel and you turn and you pivot, man, you lose your footing because you're on the ball of your foot instead of using your rotation, your body, and your hips. And I was like, oh, I think I know what he means now. You know, I get it. You know, so you know that just it just shows that some people are not taking that time to invest in the art that they truly they're not understanding the art that they're doing they're they're mimicking movement and nowadays with social media everyone's following a flow pattern or this or that or the other and you see it all the time you see it all the time and just youtube you know youtube sabai and youtube this youtube that youtube double stick youtube whatever and you'll see guys that that truly move that know and then guys that don't know and guys that think they know so if that helps he, he's totally right, too. It's the same in HEMA. The only difference is, like, you have guys in costumes doing the same things. That's <laughs> 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 the difference. Like, dude, the jester pants. I mean, seriously. Um, people get pissing people off of that one. Um, but as for Robert, I, um, yeah, I don't know if I have that so far um, in terms of the uh, the YouTube channel. Actually, it's a good idea. I might have to take that down. It's a good idea on the grips for HEMA. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. I have, like, 300 videos on our YouTube channel almost. So. That would be good. Um, 
And I'm glad to break the secrets of FMA, Elric. I'm breaking the secrets. I'm stealing the secrets. All the secrets are stolen. Elric asked, what about the feel of steel on steel? Oh, on different materials? There's nothing like it, man. It's, it's like the difference between, imagine this. You have your, you have your like, you have your first car. It's a shitty ass Civic, and you drive it around. You think it's the best thing ever. Then you get into Belton's Mustang. That's the difference. Hey, right. <laughs> that's the that's the, that's the real difference, man. It's like it, it's nothing like it. You have a, you I've have always, the synthetics. You have. I've always been fighting with sticks and synthetics, but just recently at the last tip on tip so on, good. I had a chance to train uh, or to spar with Lamont Glass using the steel trainers that we'll be using in the ring. And having that ring of steel and the vibration in my hand and hearing it like a tuning fork ring in my ear as I would chamber and send it out. And just the ring of steel changes you. Oh, Fighting with good. steel is different. And I don't think it's done enough in FMA. I mean, they do, they do aluminum and they do synthetic. But another problem with that is there's not, there's not really a lot of flex in this plastic and it's really dense. So it hits a little bit harder than rattan. So there's not a lot of flex. Whereas if we're using steel, one of these steel trainers, it flexes. I can thrust you and get a good amount of flex with this blade and not worry about damaging and breaking your sternum or giving you a hernia. Mm. You know, so one, one of that with synthetics or rattan, you could really you can really hurt somebody. You can cause a hernia, you could break someone's sternum or floating ribs. A, a nice correlation to that in the fight world. Uh, one of my fighters on the day of the fight said, hey, they're asking to, for no shin guards. I'm like, have you done no shin guards? He said, no. And when he was done, he goes, dude, kicking that thigh with my shin, that feel of hitting and smacking the crap out of him and head kicking him butt on my shin, dude, it's a rush. So the feeling of having a lot of padding and kicking away carelessly or really – planning your kick properly and and then that feeling of digging into their body and their he said he he goes i'm hooked i want to do no shin guards from here on yeah. i was like yeah man and then you add elbows and guys are like oh my god this is beautiful it's it's just it's just different you know and I, like you know whether you use a car analogy or you know like morgan had talked about and or even fighting i think fighters when they take off the shin guards are like my god i've been carelessly kicking just because of kicking and not realizing I can hurt my shit, you know? And then suddenly when they kick flesh, flesh on flesh, like, dude, that feels so good. Smack, you know? So yeah, that helps a little bit too. Yeah, yeah, no, good points from all of you guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Who's got more show? Uh, uh, more than you show anything. Uh, really, all I've got is some of the ring tools here. Um, I don't know how to really flip flip my camera. So can you just, uh, can you I've just got a small display of the the ring tools that we use uh, here. Um, these are some of the popular patterns that have been used. Um, I don't know if you can see them here. Mm -hmm. um, yes, partly. So we've got the Messer and a Dusak. We've got the Ganunting. The okay. Ganunting blade is a little bit long for what we're, we're used to, like, you know, 15 to 19 inch blades. This is a 24 inch blade, so it's a little bit long for a Ganunting. But mm. in order for the standardization, we that's how we roll. And uh, we've got the Chotel that was used. We've got other exotic examples like uh, Compilon or um, a Zanzibar. We've got the Chris, but these are rarely used. I find that most of the time the practitioners that are coming, I find that most of the time the practitioners that are coming to the event are using uh, – either the Messer or the Ganunting or the Dusak. Those seem to be yeah. the three most popular styles that get picked up off the table. All right. All right. What's uh, our, our sponsor that makes them Purple Heart Armory, he mostly made HEMA patterns, but now he's starting to explore other world cultures. Huh? So all of the Filipino designs that you'll see on his webpage were all designed for the short blade, but I've seen them in other places. I've seen the Chris pattern being used in dog brothers fights and uh and other fma discussion videos that have been posted mm. i've seen people fighting with the the, the uh, training tools so it's good to, it's good to see patterns that we've helped develop getting yeah. used no more sense so what are, all right so what are the future goals of a 
I don't want to say Citadel because that's mistaken. For the uh, Short Blade Symposium, where are you guys' future goals? So the Short Blade Symposium continues on every year. In the last weekend of June, we traditionally always host on that weekend because it's a special day for the Canadians, and it gives them a chance to to come in and over the border when they have the chance to. They get an extra day or they get a, a an extra long weekend. So I always host on that weekend. Registration opens traditionally on April 1st. I know it's a joke day for most, but it's a 90-day period from the event where people have 90 days to pre-register. Um, it will go on as long as Tuhan Belton uh, is accepting to host it at Warrior Strength Martial Arts. Uh, and until that stops happening, we'll find another location. Um, the Short Blade Symposium, being as I'm a PTK guy, deals with blades, but also we're known as an edged impact weapon technology. So we are having a second tournament called the Impact Weapons Symposium, which is the counterpart to the Short Blade Symposium in that it will be global stick arts. So we will invite stick arts from around the world, whether you are an Egyptian stick art fighter or a Tahib, uh, uh, that's like a Muslim stick art. There's uh, the FMA arts. Um, there's single stick from HEMA. So it will be everything that is involved with sticks. We're going to have events. We're going to have a staff event, but the staff will require um, some particular uh, gear, the same gear you would wear for long sword just to prevent injury based mm -hmm. on my insurance policy. Uh, we've awesome. been hosting the short blade symposium now for three or four years and we've had no injuries. The only injuries well, that we did have, uh, I would consider conditioning injuries and in that the fighter wasn't properly conditioned, whether it was a torn or ligament or a bruised ligament from a rolled ankle or something like that. Yeah, that was an injury that was incurred from recklessness or okay. from the fight. Mm -hmm. So no, that's good. That's good to know. I have an insurance policy, so we allow uh, a certain amount of gear. So for a certain fight, like the staff fight at the Impact Weapons Symposium, we'll be requiring a certain level of gear to participate. Yeah, yeah, you want, yeah, right. I mean, you want to keep your insurance. I mean, don't right. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. yeah um, so those are the. That's the future of what the Citadel plans on hosting for events are the short blade symposium and the impact weapon symposium. The oh, impact awesome. weapon symposium is still under development. We're doing a soft opening called the summer slash, which is on the 31st of this month, which is basically just a HEMA single stick event that we're hosting. Okay. Well, um, so for folks that, you know, obviously it sounds like you make this pretty well known, but folks that want to get involved, so again, it goes without saying it's experience helpful but not required. Is that safe? I would uh, say it's you should, probably should have some experience. Have some. Experience. Yeah, you're fighting in a tournament with uh, competitors and athletes that are training for this level of fight. So the entry level person usually winds up in the synthetic division. Okay. And okay. in 2020, we had planned on announcing the steel division for the Messer or the Machete class, but that was only going to be available to return fighters and um, to invites only. And the reason I wanted to do that was it would give the beginning level fighters and the mid level fighters a chance to podium because all three years that we've hosted, oh, yeah. the podium has been pretty much dominated by the same names. Oh, so I'm yeah. going to start shifting those fighters into judges roles and into the steel division and they can fight in an, an advanced division. And then that allows for the people who are newer to get their first year in when the synthetic division, so that if they do decide they want to move on to the, the, the more advanced practitioners and fight with steel, they can do that or they can stay in the open pools with the synthetics. And let, let's be honest that normally the joke is between the three of us and I'll just share it. Um, it's pretty funny is, uh, does does Lamont meet Jesse in the semi, or does he meet him in the final? Finals, right? <laughs> it's usually what happens. Like, oh, exactly. when does he meet Jesse? The when these two guys clash, and it's it's every year they clash. So I'm tired of the same names taking my prizes. I would like other people to enjoy the wealth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So I'm going to move them on to Steel Division and figure something else out for them. And they will make those guys judge so we can get a break and enjoy exactly. watching They're fights. Very experienced <laughs> fighters, so they'll be great judges. Awesome. Now, though, awesome. They're all great fighters, those guys. I mean, honestly, right. much respect to all the guys, especially the guys who are making top eight in our tournament. And it's it's a grueling – it's grueling for a small – condensed tournament the guys who show up they have great sportsmanship but it's grueling it's brutal not just for the judges I've had people it's, from it's, the it's, it's a tough, group, tough tournament right. i've had people from the hema group come to the 2019 event and because it was such a small condensed event they said every fight felt like a finals match mm -hmm. because of the, uh, the, the, the condensation of advanced level fighters. awesome yeah. awesome yeah wow well i think you, what you guys are doing is you know, I have such profound respect for you guys and what you're doing. I mean, you know, I think it's great. Um, so what, um, okay. So uh, tell us, you know, uh, one sometimes I ask, you know, for uh, closing is, um, you know, what would you like to see change? We'll start with you, Lee. What would you like to see positive changes within the HEMA community? Huh, that's a long question for a different oh, interview. Oh, that's loaded. That's too loaded, uh, man. Give, I mean, give us a quick, give us a Give us a quick. Give it a give, go, Lee. Do it. Honestly, more professionalism, less costumes, more serious, more serious about conditioning and fighting. Okay, that's hey, that works. Tuan Belton, what would you like to see? All the positive changes in our FMA community. <laughs> uh, you know, I I think uh, I think the guys need to spar more. Um, I think, you know, romancing the stone is is awesome, but. Um, you know, if you're doing it for the art and doing it for staying healthy and movement, movement's good. I, I get it. It is a combat. It's like I do Muay Thai and I hit the bag, but I will never hit Thai pads or work on the clinch or never. You, you, at one point, you got to kind of keep it real with yourself and, and say, hey, you know, am I going to take this art seriously? Then you need to spar. You need to understand that when it comes down to it, are you even going to pull the same moves that you are? So that's one. Um, I really respect the fact that the Hema guys um, – even outside of short blade started showing up to these other local stick fighting um, tournaments, you know, Tipon Tipon. And they're also looking at, you know, like Morgan's opening up that uh, impact um, uh, impact uh, portion. So they're, they're rounding out their game and they're really, they're taking their, they're taking this seriously. And I think sometimes no offense FMA guys, but the other FMA guys aren't taking it that seriously. And so when I see that Jason and his girl and, and some other people coming out from Portland and doing this deep on deep on because they're like, well, when's the next FMA one? Because I need to take on some of these FMA guys because, man, they got different angles and different looks. Mm. That's like a fighter saying, I want to spar more people because I I want to be a better fighter. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that huge respect to that. Instead of like, I'm always going to pick on the white belt in class because I feel <laughs> powerful. It's like, bro, you're not improving. Stop. You know? yeah, 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 so yeah. I, I, I respect that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, and surely not, last but not least, uh, Morgan, what do you think we'd like to see improvements in the FMA community? I surely do not have the clarity or experience to overshadow what my teacher just spoke to, so I'm not going to speak to that. But I will say that the International Short Blade Symposium and the International Impact Weapon Symposium are open to all groups of all cultures and we would like to see you at our events and that's the best i can offer that's all right hey we'll take it all right well this has been absolutely wonderful uh, any social media we want social media uh, people uh lee people that might want to follow up on you and see what you're about what you're doing where can they uh, all right we have all sorts of social media we just started TikTok. i should have done it earlier but it belt totally beat me the punch on TikTok, so i started huh? finally started TikTok. Um, there's no dancing. It's just usually cutting and stuff. We have TikTok. We have a huge YouTube channel. We have, a, as, as as Robert uh, mentioned in the in the uh, chat, our YouTube channel is like 84,000 subs now and awesome. growing fast still, which is good. Um, we have Instagram. I mean, it's updated frequently. I'm going to start pushing that mm -hmm. further this year. And we have, of course, our Facebook page. And and honestly, I'm, and for those interested in him, I am running online programs right now as we speak. So I have students so, as far away as I have a Philippines group. I have a Hungarian group now. I have a oh, Mexican oh, group oh, forming. Okay. So, I mean, the tendrils are going out. <laughs> do you to, uh, no, good for you. Good for you. If they want to train with you online, best way to get a hold of you, Facebook? Yep, for sure. 
Okay, okay, okay. Facebook yep. Messenger. Facebook right. through the Blood and Iron through the Blood and Iron um through the Blood and Iron Messenger. That's the best way to find me to get to okay. talk to me. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right, and we got all right, uh, Morgan. Folks said maybe you want to get a hold of you or that Facebook. What's the best way? Yeah, that's the best place to get a hold of me. I'm always on Facebook Messenger. I'm usually you got available. The YouTube uh, channel, too, right? What's that, my friend? You got the YouTube channel too, right? Citadel. Yeah, the Citadel Combat Arena can be found. That's generally where most of the official content is posted for uh, the Short Blade Symposium. Lee posts a lot of content on his channel to Croft so that the HEMA people get to see what's going on in the FMA you know, world gets to see from my end. Um, Chuhan Belton has, you know, I'll let him speak to his own. But yeah, I've got my my YouTube channel and my Facebook is basically okay. all I really keep yeah. track of. Yeah. And Chuhan Belton, I know you mentioned this when you were on by yourself, but just for the folks maybe who are not aware. We got uh, two two Belton is the man at Gmail. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> 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 the man at gmail.com. Six, six, uh, six and chicks at gmail.com. No. Um, oh, not even politically correct anymore. <laughs> warrior, warrior strength trainer uh, at gmail.com if you want to email. But you guys, I mean, you can find me on social media, drop a message. I'm pretty good about answering stuff, you know. So, yeah, Facebook. Yeah. So I, I think it's safe to say if those who want to get a hold of you, Facebook Messenger, probably yeah, the best way. Yeah, that works. <laughs> yep. Well, this was enjoyable. This is educational for me, just hearing about what you guys are doing and what's coming down the pipeline. And I love the ones where you, I actually, you know, learn or get exposed to new things, what people are doing. And, you know, and so I appreciate you guys coming on. I really do. And, you know, I know on a Saturday afternoon, you guys could have probably had better things to do. So I always appreciate when guys take time out of their day to come and, uh, you know, talk about their stuff. So I really appreciate it, you know. Right after this, I'm out to the Sal, which is just uh, literally a minute from here. I'm going to just walk out to my backyard where they where where our new our new space is. I have a bunch yeah. of students out there sparring right now, and I'm gonna throw my sparring gear and go hit people. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's built, and honestly, you'd love the new setup, man. We just mortgaged our property, so we just finally after you probably follow seen things on Facebook, but. We've been going through hell to get a mortgage, mortgage up here in Canada. Finally mortgaged our property, so we own the house now. And we have 1,200 square foot, um, basically a renovated garage with 14 foot high ceilings in the back. Nice. So nice. enough to run a small club on my property. Nice. So. What you guys can do, here's a suggestion for just, it just came to mind. I don't know if it would be feasible or not for a future interview. When you guys are actually doing the next one, if there's a way to um, you kind of cover it live, I don't know if that'd be because you guys sound like a pretty busy judging. I don't, you know. Uh, you know. Yeah, well, like, um, generally, yeah, generally, I if I have enough staff going and I have enough because uh, Lee takes over the main direction of the ring and Belton is his second, and then if we have enough staff, I'm not working, so then I'm behind the camera and I'm able to catch things live do live streaming, capture media for the YouTube channel. But if I have to hold the batons and I'm working, it's really difficult. And I, sometimes I don't have a media person. Sometimes I'll stick the camera up and just let it run for an hour. Yeah, 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 but then yeah, you yeah. wind up with this giant file that just gets corrupted and you can never just, get off the camera. So just think about I have it. a little I mean, bit of a problem with media collection. Yeah, the only thing is what we're trying to, what we're trying to do is we're, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to uh, get some coverage on live events and run them and kind of do like a mini interview. But at the same time, really for you guys that you guys are actually show your live event going on, you know what I mean? Um, so just, well, I would, uh, it is possible I would to do it by saying that you're more than welcome to come and catch yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I, I, yeah. your community. I love to do this. You have an opportunity to do live interviews. You have an opportunity to catch live content you know, and you're, you're invited. Like you're more than welcome. Been there since I think Mark Denny, like 2002 or so. So I would love okay. it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm too. But the problem is I uh, have family now, so it's not me going alone anymore. <laughs> right. You know, that, that's a hard sell, man. Oh, you know, see you in a week. I'm going to California or whatever. Uh, 
I don't know. You know, you know, the Pacific Northwest is beautiful, man. It's a yeah, beautiful place. Vancouver. There's another one like we were talking about the other day, Vancouver. Like I Washington State, it. Oregon, Vancouver, Vancouver Island. Like, I mean, honestly, it is a truly yeah. a beautiful place. I mean, we all can agree on that. I, I would love it's to go. It's a fight to mecca of the, of the United States, I would say. A lot of stuff was going on in the Pacific Northwest. Now I heard nothing about it. Chemo and FMA. FMA. So yeah, one last thing here, just touch on something Belton said earlier. See what Belton thinks. You mentioned leg shots. So how many of those does proper number 12 get tonight? Tony, oh, what? Lee just how many out. leg shots does he get tonight? Yeah, just does does, 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 does uh, Conor McGregor eat tonight from uh, oh, geez. Oh, oh, the fight, Dustin and Conor. Yeah, yeah. Man, oh, that's right. That's right. You know, well, you know. Hey, all right. Let's do this. I'm going way out of my zone here. Just uh, Lee, who do you got tonight? Who do I got tonight? Poirier, Poirier in, in two or three. Uh, Morgan, who do you got tonight? You know, I I just want to see McGregor get submitted. I don't want to see him get knocked out. I want to see right, him get McGregor submitted. to lose and by submission. Uh, to on Bell, yeah. who, who do you got tonight? You know, I just want to see McGregor give a good fight because I think I, – I, I just want to see this. I just want to see him get a good fight because I have a bad feeling he was talking more than – I think Poirier is gonna bring the heat, and McGregor is, uh, you know, he's he's trying yeah. to play that b bad boy role, and if he just needs to just give a good fight, which I'm excited. If he does, I'm excited for it. I just want to. But see I that. found this up in Canada. Proper number twelve. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you're gonna drink that shit. You know what, man? I saw it, and it came with a free shot glass, and I'm a sucker for free stuff. So I was like, and and all my guys are here tonight. We're what we just we're just like. Chipped in for the pay per view, so we're just gonna after fighting, we're gonna watch fighting, which is gonna be awesome. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a big MMA good. fan, I'm, or I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big martial arts fan. Let's put it that way. So, yeah, but this is just like it was like on special for thirty bucks in Canada. It's a good deal. So, either it'll be yeah, terrible, and give me a hangover, that's one of the or things it'll I be lure Lee down I'm into the uh, into the states, the lower forty eight. Is I tell him I'm gonna buy him a big bottle of Blantons. If this is for you, Lee. If he this judges for the you, tournament. Lee. <laughs> We just That's had grappling class the other day, and there's a pass. Well. There's a pass we call the Canadian pass. Oh. And you, you know what it is? What? You, think you, you do the pass, and it? you say, sorry. <laughs> 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 because it was, it's, such a, it's, a, it's sorry. a stupid pass that you feel stupid that they passed your guard, and then you say, sorry. So we literally call it the Canadian pass. Uh, anyway, hey, what's um, up, dude? That's That's awesome. Awesome. Do you think Connor? Right, we've gone on for almost two hours now, guys. You, out, you think he's starting to do far as prime and age? He just keeps making money, though. He's just like he's just like man. This guy can just yeah, blast the cash. I don't even understand how he makes so much money. He's uh, talented. It, I just want to yeah. see a good fight. I just want to see a good fight from a talented fighter that talks a lot. But I just want to see a good fight. Yeah. That's all. How yeah, about Burns? Wonder, how Wonder Boy? How about Wonder Boy and uh, and Burns? Oh man, I like, I, that. I, I like I like that matchup. Looks good too, though. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just gonna enjoy enjoy sitting back watching. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I never have a dog in these fights, but I kind of like to find them. Like, I just want to see good competitive, like you know, something that people are worth what they're spending their money for. You know, what you I mean? know, people like, people always ask me, "Did you see the fight?" And I say, "No." And then they look at me like, "Why didn't you see the fight?" I said, "Because I was cornering a fight." They're like, <laughs> yeah. "Wait, what do you mean?" I go, "I have fights." this next three weekends so you understand i'm never at a bar watching a fighter at home i'm at a fight cornering a fight and then the yeah. coaches in the back are looking at their phones going did you just see it i'm like ah, ah stop we're trying to you know we're trying to focus here yeah I, one uh, three months in a row i every weekend i had a fight i could not i could not watch a fight no matter what so yeah, yeah. i don't buy them yeah i wait till, i wait till they go on youtube I, i'm cheap <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting to see Warrior Strength in the um, in the, inside the big oct inside the octagon. So I have yeah. like definite person to cheer for, regardless. We we are we are fighting an Ultimate Fighter guy, so this might put us. Are you? Um, who's who's yeah. your who's your guy? Uh, we're fighting guy. Uh, we're fighting Ricky Steele. So Carlos Lozoya is fighting Ricky Steele this July 31st. Oh, congrats! Yeah, in, oh, in Montana. Wow. In Montana, so it's you know he's a TOF guy. He's the ultimate. He's an ultimate. The ultimate fighter. Um, uh, you know, he was in the show. So, and then Albert, uh, Albert is fighting in Emerald Queen Casino, fighting some heavy hitters. And so, we're 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 coming along. I got a lot of fighters. So, Lee, yeah. you want Lee, you want someone to cheer? Check out Belton's guy, Crew Micah. 
Cool. That guy's a monster. That's awesome. Yeah, he actually had uh, he actually had uh, Adesanya on pod, uh, on on Facebook or on Instagram, and he actually interviewed Anderson Silva. So Anderson Silva said said that he'll come here and train, which it probably end up in my gym. But we'll see. Mm, oh, awesome! Oh, That's wow! Big, you guys are that. Yep. Is he oh, going to yeah, show you Steven Seagal's kick? <laughs> you gotta, uh, another yeah, moderator needs to do a test run for uh, another interview, so he just he just messaged me, so he's politely uh, kicking me out. So, um, but uh, again, I want to just thank you guys. Absolute pleasure. Thank you guys all for right. coming on. Um, you know, I salute, man. Deep respect. I salute you all for what you guys are doing, and um, hopefully, this won't be the last time you guys come on and all that. And you know, I absolutely. Also, oh, thank you, you so much, Drew. Open Dean. door. You know. Awesome. Thank Likewise, you so much. Door springs both Good ways. seeing you guys again. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, but uh, you guys take care. All right. Thank all you. Right. Thank you guys. Take care for now. See you. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Dude. Absolutely. My pleasure. It was a little, uh, we'll make it happen again. Take care, my friend. You too. All right, folks, uh, we're out tomorrow night. Uh, Tom Payne has got somebody. Uh, matter of fact, I think he's kicking me off now for a test run. So I'm going to keep this short, and I'll see you guys uh, uh, next time. You guys uh, take care. Bye. <laughs>